Hello, everyone. I hope you can all see and hear me. Uh, welcome to this uh, second live session of uh, the University of Nicosia's uh, MOOC on uh, Decentralized Finance. Uh, this is George Yaglis, uh, and uh, as usual, we will go through the uh, main uh, slides and messages of today's uh, topic, which is the DeFi uh, stack, as you, as you can see, and then we'll be uh, taking your questions. Uh, just a reminder to everyone, I will not be able to monitor the chat uh, button, uh, the chat function during the uh, live session, but my colleagues uh, Lambis and uh, Manos are with me and they are going to be doing that. So please use the chat function for, for general questions. If you have any questions for me related to uh, what we're going to be discussing during the live session, Please use the Q&A uh, button. I'm going to be able to, uh, to look at this in real time as I go through the slides. Uh, Lambis and Manos are also going to be monitoring this and answer any questions that they can. But uh, whenever they cannot uh, answer a question in writing, I will be uh, trying to, uh, to answer it. Uh, hi, Luis. Uh, please don't use the Q&A to say hi. Uh, because it uh, just uh, floods the um, uh, the chat. Please use the, the chat button for, for uh, general discussion. So uh, with this necessary disclaimer introduction, uh, let's see uh, where we are. Uh, as a reminder, this is a 12 week course. We started last week by looking at the fundamentals and explaining how the course will, uh, will run. This is the second week where we are going to start exploring the different layers of uh, protocols, applications, and systems that together comprise what we call decentralized finance. Uh, so we're going to introduce what we call the DeFi application stack. Uh, and then as of next week, I will hand over to my colleague, uh, Klitos, who will be uh, taking over the class for two weeks to discuss the more technical infrastructural uh, aspects of Ethereum and other layer one and layer two blockchains and bridges. Um, so our agenda for today, uh, we are going to introduce the different layers of the DeFi application stack. And these from bottom to top are the settlement layer, the layer where the assets live, the layer where the protocols are deployed, uh, the layer where the applications are being accessed from and the layer where uh, applications can be aggregated into uh, composable um, higher level applications of DeFi. And since composability is, uh, is an interesting aspect, we're going to be uh, addressing it a little bit today because we're going to delve into details as we uh, go about in the remainder of the course before concluding and providing some further reading for you. As always, uh, I, I mean, I saw a couple of comments in the discussion forum on Moodle, so thank you for this, but please take note that we, we try to strike a balance here. So on the one hand, we want to be practical enough to be able to refer to real life applications that exist in the DeFi world today. On the other hand, we don't want anyone to think that the when we mention a specific application, it means that we consider it better uh, than its uh, competitors or, or other similar applications that exist out there. Everything is just for educational and uh, illustrative purposes only. So uh, without further ado, let me go into the DeFi stack layers. And I borrow this, uh, uh, this picture from, uh, from a paper uh, to, to introduce how we can think of DeFi applications as belonging to different layers of abstraction. Now, those of you that are familiar with similar frameworks, like for example, the layers of, uh, of the internet and so on, will immediately recognize that this uh, typology, as with every typology, is purely indicative. It's purely for illustrative purposes. The lines and boundaries uh, that uh, separate each layer cannot be objectively um, uh, drawn because there are 
innovators out there, either entrepreneurs or researchers or engineers that are always working to create applications or protocols that might, by, by, the, by their design, cross between the boundaries of, of each uh, layer that you see here. However, the framework itself is useful for someone that comes uh, into, the, uh, into the DeFi space as a beginner to understand what we're talking about, how different things are being built, how they fit with each other, uh, and so on and so forth. So we're going to go through these layers one by one, starting from the bottom. Uh, I'm going to do my best to explain in as simple terms as I can uh, what belongs and what doesn't belong to each layer and how they all fit together. And then hopefully in the coming weeks, we are going to um, uh, open, so to say, each of these layers and start discussing specific uh, instances uh, of, of uh, real life DeFi applications in them. So let us start from the beginning and the beginning is the bottom, is the settlement layer because this is the foundation where uh, everything is uh, happening as, the, um, as, as you can see uh, here. The settlement layer is where all the transactions are ultimately settled. Don't forget that DeFi is about financial applications and financial applications means financial transactions. So no matter how you access a DeFi uh, protocol or a DeFi application through, for example, a web interface or through direct deployment and execution of a smart contract code, or whatever, at some point, some financial transaction needs to happen that will change the state of an underlying network. And by changing the state, I mean, at the very basic level, updating the balances. Some tokens might be uh, bought, some others might be sold, uh, there might be some swapping, uh, there might be some data um, uh, updating and some metadata uh, refreshing uh, happening in the background some transaction would need to be ultimately settled in an underlying network. And this network is what belongs to the settlement layer. As you will see here in the picture, the settlement layer is typically a blockchain. Not all blockchains are uh, equally susceptible to lending themselves to DeFi applications. Uh, the Ethereum blockchain has been up to now the most popular and widely used ones. Next week uh, and the week after, you will discuss with Kletos the reasons why. Uh, but whether we are on Ethereum or on any other blockchain, there needs to be a network, uh, an underlying network that will provide uh, the security and the finality of transactions in uh, DeFi. As you will see on the left, typically that blockchain will have its native asset. Its native asset in the case of Ethereum, for example, is an asset, uh, an asset called Ether. Uh, we'll discuss assets a little bit, but this is an example of why some things cannot be uh, you know, conveniently placed uh, in, in a single layer. So assets, either native or uh, non-native belong both to the settlement layer because Ether, for example, is, is part of, uh, of, of the core functionality of Ethereum. You cannot have Ethereum without uh, using Ether to pay for gas for the uh, execution of transactions or the uh, deployment of smart contracts. But other assets that are non-native, and I'll explain what this means, uh, belong to, to a higher level, okay? So that's, that's, that's a good example, even from the first picture that some things uh, cross uh, the boundaries between levels. So the settlement layer is the first layer where uh, things happen. First, not chronologically, not in terms of time sequence, but first in the sense that this is the foundation on which everything needs to be um, uh, uh, put. So sometimes we call, you will see the term layer one to define, to, 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 to speak of the settlement layer or L1 as you might see it abbreviated. Okay, so the settlement layer is the foundation on all activities in any decentralized ecosystem. This is not only um, about DeFi, but for all other applications built on top of a, a decentralized uh, uh, ecosystem. 
Usually it consists of an underlying blockchain. Uh, I, I say usually here because um, a blockchain or a distributed ledger technology as it is more formally known is just one type of technology on which you can build decentralized applications. There are other types of technologies available out there, but for the sake of simplicity, we'll refer to all these technologies as a, as a blockchain in this course. For those of you that want to get into the details of how underlying blockchains work, uh, again, we have the other MOOC, the Introduction to Digital Currency, where we discuss these things in more detail, although the majority of these things are also going to be discussed, at least the basic ones, in weeks uh, three and four in, in this course, the next two weeks. So the settlement layer consists of this underlying blockchain on which all transactions ultimately happen, as well the native asset of this blockchain. When, when I say native, I mean the asset of the blockchain itself. So Bitcoin, for example, as a blockchain has Bitcoin as its underlying asset. Ethereum has uh, Ether as its, uh, as its uh, native asset. Uh, Solana, the blockchain, has Solana the token as its native asset and so on and so forth. Many blockchains will allow you to, to, to define, uh, create, mint uh, other tokens, other assets. These are the assets that we call as non-native assets on the blockchain. So you might have, I don't know, uh, the, the APE token or the um, uh, uh, UNI token on, on Ethereum. These are non-native tokens that live on the Ethereum blockchain, but Ether is the uh, native, to uh, native asset of the Ethereum's uh, blockchain. The functionality of the settlement layer is, is threefold. It stores information, value, and ownership securely. So the uh, security is one of the uh, main uh, services provided by the uh, settlement layer. The settlement layer is also where we ensure that any status changes, either uh, balances uh, updated, ownership changes, data uh, updates, uh, are being recorded in a way that follows the particular technical rules of its uh, layer one blockchain. And the settlement layer also enables trustless execution of smart contracts. By trustless, I mean that uh, we, we uh, as, soon as, as long as we trust the code running on the blockchain, we do not need to trust each individual node or player or user within the decentralized system trust is being uh, embedded in uh, the protocol. Again, as we said, since, since settlement is the first uh, layer, the, the most fundamental layer in the DeFi stack, uh, these blockchains that belong to this layer are sometimes referred to as layer one uh, blockchains. Next slide. So uh, layer one blockchains can be any blockchain that allows the uh, execution of uh, smart contracts. So there have been many uh, that, that have been used um, uh, or proposed to be used for DeFi applications with varying degrees of success. Uh, as I said, Ethereum is by far the, the most popular, but Avalanche or the Binance Smart Chain, BSC or Solana or Polkadot or others might be uh, equally or not equally uh, suited for these types of applications. Uh, I remember I saw a question on, uh, on Moodle, I think, uh, about whether Bitcoin uh, would make a, uh, a good layer one blockchain for DeFi applications. The answer is no. Um, uh, okay, it's a qualified answer, so I need to I need to, to to say a little bit more details because under assumptions it might, but Bitcoin when it was built back in two thousand and eight by Satoshi Nakamoto was not designed as a platform that would allow for the creation of non-native assets nor the execution of smart contracts. So. Um, for the non-technically minded members of the audience, let's let's say that Bitcoin as a blockchain is a much more restricted uh, blockchain on which there are only a few things that can happen. The, the script language, the script programming language that is used 
in Bitcoin is not what we call Turing complete language. So you cannot write all sorts of applications on top of it. There is a limit to the functionality that can be um, uh, implemented on top of Bitcoin. So with Bitcoin alone, uh, you cannot build uh, DeFi applications on top of it. Now, having said that, there have been attempts, and I'm sure that there will be uh, more in the future, of, uh, of protocols trying to build what we call layer twos, so a, a layer on top of Bitcoin that would allow for smart contract execution uh, on the Bitcoin uh, blockchain. So, for example, Stacks is, a, is, a, is an example of, uh, of such a, a project. And to the extent that you know, these projects um, uh, succeed, they will allow for, for applications like DeFi to be built on top of blockchain, but natively without, without any layer two, uh, Bitcoin is not uh, uh, suitable for, for deploying uh, DeFi applications or any other sorts of uh, smart contracts uh, for that matter. So uh, this was the settlement layer, and then we have the, the, the asset layer. As the, as the name suggests, the, the layer, this is the layer where the assets uh, used in the DeFi applications live. And these assets can be uh, broken down into different categories. So we have what we call native assets that belong to the, to the underlying blockchain, and therefore they cross the boundaries between the asset and the settlement layer. But we have also other types of tokens that uh, uh, are being built in the um, uh, asset layer itself. Uh, and they are built by the, those uh, developers that build the different uh, applications and protocol that uh, uh, make up what we call DeFi uh, in order to enable their applications to have functionalities that have to do with, for example, things like governance or liquidity provision or any other functionality that is not natively covered by the native asset of the underlying block blockchain. As you see in this, um, uh, in this figure, there are different types of non-native tokens and there are different standards on which these tokens can be built. So we have uh, fungible and non-fungible tokens, or as you might know them, NFTs. Uh, fungibility is a property um, of, uh, of systems that uh, has to do with the ability to exchange between units of uh, different uh, tokens uh, without loss of value. So a fungible token is by definition a token in which all the units have uh, equal value. So if, if I have one Ether, if, if, if is, a, is a fungible token. So if I have one Ether and you have one Ether and you send me your Ether and I send you yours, we exchange our ETH, uh, we, we, we still have one Ether. It's, it, doesn't, it doesn't make any, um, uh, any difference. Let's say simplistically that all units are born equal in a, in a fungible token, or all, all Ether are the same. Now, I have to put a number of asterisks here because there might be tainted ETH that we know that they have been used in uh, criminal or illicit transactions. So what I've just said is not 100% technically true, but uh, for the sake of simplicity, let's say that you know all ETH are equal, so Ether is a fungible token. However, there are other types of tokens that are non-fungible, non-exchangeable in, in, uh, in nature without uh, loss of value. So for example, if you have two crypto punks and I have a, you know, a, a rare alien and you have a, a, a simple uh, 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 crypto punk without you know, any, any interesting uh, attribute or whatever, these two tokens, although they belong to the same collection, they're both crypto punks, they are not of the same value. Uh, as a matter of fact, you know, if I have an alien, it might be at least in the valuable token. So these tokens that cannot be mutually interchangeable at the same value are called non-fungible tokens or NFTs. Each underlying blockchain uh, that is Turing complete and allows for the execution of smart contracts uh, has standards that allow developers to create, to mint, 
such types of tokens. So for example, in the Ethereum blockchain, the ERC20 standard is the standard that governs how fungible tokens should be uh, built, whereas the ERC721 is the token, the standard that governs the development of uh, non-fungible uh, tokens of NFTs. In other blockchains, for example, in Solana, uh, the, the standard used for to build fungible tokens is called SPL. Uh, the in, in Binance Smart Chain, it's called uh, BEP20. So there are different standards that, uh, that, that govern how different tokens are being uh, developed in different blockchains, but this is quite technical for, for the purposes of this course. So uh, in, in summary, the asset layer refers to all the tokens, all the assets that uh, are being exchanged in, uh, in, uh, on top of a blockchain. These include both the native tokens, the settlement layer tokens, and the non-native tokens that are built by DeFi applications. Um, each layer one blockchain has its own rules, as I've said. So different standards, ERC20 or SPL or BEP20 are different standards for building um, uh, fungible tokens. Uh, ERC721 is the standard for building NFTs. Uh, and so on. Now, having said that, in DeFi, most of the um, uh, of the tokens are of, of the fungible nature because we're talking about money here. Uh, DeFi is about finance and transactions. Most of the um, uh, uh, financial transactions will happen on instruments that have the same properties as money and money is, is, is fungible by definition. So again, if you have $1 and I have $1 and we exchange, uh, we, we didn't lose any value or gained any value. So it's the same uh, type of value of token in the same uh, collection. Uh, I see a couple of uh, uh, questions that are being answered by my colleagues, but let me just say that uh, since I see one of them is about se sem semi fungible tokens, and there's a standard in Ethereum called ERC-1155 uh, for the development of semi-fungible tokens, that this is a newer and not so much used type of token uh, in which uh, a token might start as, as fungible. And then uh, when it is used or redeemed or somehow, uh, you know, uh, changes um, uh, nature, it might become non-fungible. So for example, this is useful, useful in applications like blockchain-based gaming, where you might have fungible uh, in-app money that gets exchanged for non-fungible tokens like you know, a weapon or an armor or something uh, without changing the actual token. Um, or it might be for things like, I don't know, concert tickets where you know before the concert, uh, it's it's token that belongs to a particular sitting area and a particular date of the concert is fungible, so it can be exchanged with each other. But after that, it becomes, it, it has a totally different utility because now the concert has already happened. The token has more of a collective value. So it might be you know, much cheaper or, or much more expensive uh, than the original ticket. Uh, so it might become an NFT and so on and so forth. Uh, but for the, for the, majority of the applications and the majority of the discussion around uh, DeFi standards like uh, ERC 1155 are not going to be of, of uh, interest to us. I quickly saw um, uh, a comment that said, uh, asked whether ERC 20 is the same as ETH. The answer is no. ETH is one token and is the native token of the Ethereum blockchain. ERC20 is not a token, it is a standard on which fungible tokens can be built on the Ethereum blockchain. So uh, Uni, Sushi, OneInch, uh, Maker, Compound, you name it, are all ERC20 type tokens. Next slide. So again, on the, on the question of tokens, uh, the 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 reason to have a native token and the need to have non-native tokens 
in, uh, in DeFi is because they serve very different functions. So for example, the native tokens are the lifeblood of the, of the underlying blockchain. Uh, in, in Ethereum, um, let's say I'm using Uniswap as a decentralized exchange. Again, we haven't introduced exchanges yet. So uh, for those of you that are very new to this space, don't worry if you don't understand what, what I'm saying. But let's say that I'm using Uniswap and I'm exchanging uh, token A for token B both of A and B being uh, some, some ERC-20 tokens, non-native. Let's say I'm exchanging Uni to Sushi. I will need to issue a transaction on the Ethereum blockchain and we need to pay gas to pay transaction fees. These transaction fees are always going to be paid in ETH, the underlying native token of the Ethereum blockchain. Even if I'm you know, exchanging um, uh, uh, as I said, you need to sushi. I'm not paying the transaction fees. The transaction fees are not denominated in either uni or sushi in, in the settlement layer. They are always being uh, denominated in the native token. So the native token is what you definitely need uh, in order to access any DeFi or other application on top of a blockchain. The non-native tokens are application specific. Okay, the native token is blockchain specific, so Ether for Ethereum. Uh, the non-native tokens are application specific. So for Uniswap, the token is called Uni. For uh, the lending platform called Aave, the uh, eponymous token with the same name uh, is also called Aave. For, for Maker, uh, a decentralized stablecoin insurance and, um, and lending system, it has two tokens, uh, Maker, which is a governance token, and DAI, which is a stable coin. We'll explain all this throughout the course. I just want you to understand at this point that there are different types of non-native tokens depending on the uh, uh, application, the DeFi application we're using and the functionality of uh, uh, this uh, application. Whereas there is only one native token uh, per blockchain, for example, Ether in the case of Ethereum. Uh, as I've said, these are the, the most important standards. ERC-20, uh, the most widely used one. There are others as well, but they are mostly not used nowadays. So this is the standard API application programming interface for creating fungible tokens on the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, every ERC-20 token, all of its units uh, will be interchangeable and have the same value with each other. ERC-721, the most um, uh, widely used standard for NFTs, so for non-fungible, unique, and non-defeasible uh, tokens. So in ERC-721, you cannot own a percentage of a crypto bank. You either have a crypto bank or you don't have a crypto bank. You cannot divide um, uh, the units in, in decimal uh, places like you would do for, for ERC-20 tokens. And then ERC-1155, a much newer, less used uh, standard that is, however, um, uh, growing, that supports all types of tokens under a single standard. So the idea of 1155 is to create a more economical environment, uh, cost-saving, I mean, economical for, for developers to create uh, tokens that could be fungible, non-fungible, or change status between fungible and non-fungible, hence called semi-fungible, uh, under the same uh, token contract. Now, one might ask at this point in time, why do we need um, application-specific tokens for DeFi? Why can't we do everything in, in Ether? And the reason is because the, the application developers want to implement functionality that is specific to each particular application and might be uh, they might need to issue more tokens because they need to have different levels or types of functionality within their application. So two possible and most widely used types of um, tokens in, uh, in DeFi are governance tokens and liquidity provision tokens. So a governance token, as the name suggests, allows people to own 
part of a of an underlying protocol and be able to govern it, i.e. make decisions around it. Only the governance token holders may submit or vote or protocol governance proposals depending on, on how the, um, uh, the protocol rules have been set. So um, if, if, you, if, you, if you hold, uh, I don't know, the ENS token for the Ethereum name service uh, protocol, uh, the number of protocols you have determines your way, your, your, the weight of your votes in any governance decision. So in decentralized applications, ideally, we want to have decentralized uh, decision making. And simplistically, you can think of governance tokens as similar to, to, to shares of a company. So the more shares you have, the more uh, weight your votes have in the General Assembly or wherever a, a decision needs to be made. The difference here is that um, uh, the, the, the proposals and the execution of accepted proposals happens automatically at the smart contract level as opposed to you know, being voted and then having to be acted upon uh, by some individual. Uh, the second type of, of tokens that I'm not going to go into more detail because they, uh, they require some knowledge that we will not uh, visit until week six is uh, LP tokens. LP stands for liquidity provision. So these tokens are effectively receipts that a liquidity provider uh, receives for providing liquidity to, a, to an underlying liquidity pool. Uh, let's say that I want to build a decentralized exchange where people could go and swap uh, Ether for uh, uh, USDC, for example. I would need to create a liquidity pool, a pool that consists of both Ether and uh, USDC tokens. So someone that wants to be uh, a liquidity provider in this pool, they want to uh, uh, give their tokens to be used as, as liquidity for others to, to be doing exchanges. They would deposit an equal amount in monetary value of Ether and USDC uh, to this pool, and they would need to get some sort of receipt saying that, you know, uh, I've got something that proves that I own one Ether and 2,000 uh, USDC in this pool. Uh, so they would receive in exchange an LP token, a liquidity provision token uh, for this uh, liquidity pool that proves the percentage of shares of that liquidity pool that they own. Uh, hence, they will be able to exchange these tokens at a later stage uh, to, to get back their, uh, uh, their share of the pool in Ether and USDC. Again, we are very early in the course, so if this all doesn't make much sense uh, to, to you, please bear with us and in, in, in a few sessions time, we'll, uh, uh, we'll make sure that everything makes sense. Now let's move to the to the next layer, which is probably the, the core layer of all DeFi, because the protocol layer is where all uh, DeFi applications lie. This is where DeFi happens. We need the tokens, we need the underlying blockchain for things to happen, but we implement things here. The protocols that we call DeFi uh, are going to be in this layer. So either uh, protocols for decentralized exchanges or for decentralized lending and borrowing platforms or decentralized asset management, derivatives and synthetic assets or any other type of uh, application is being uh, developed in this layer as a smart contract that runs on top of a blockchain in this layer and uses native and non-native assets in this layer, okay? So, next slide. So the protocol layer includes the core functionality of all dApps. When I use the term dApps, I mean about decentralized applications, uh, smart contracts. Uh, all dApps are implemented as, as smart contracts in, in a smart contract enabling blockchain. That's why for example, we cannot use Bitcoin uh, directly because Bitcoin does not allow for the creation of, of smart contracts. Uh, and I want 
here to take one second just to, to clarify something that uh, I have seen that confuses even uh, some seasoned DeFi users. Most of us will access uh, a DeFi application through some sort of web interface. So we go to Aave.com and we access Aave. No, we're not. If we go to any standard web to interface, what we access is an application that interacts with a smart contract that is actually Aave. So the actual Aave uh, DAP lives as a smart contract on the Ethereum blockchain. If you are a developer and you know Solidity or you can access a smart contract uh, directly, you may be able to access directly the protocol layer. However, for the vast majority of us, we go on a web page, which belongs to a different layer, a higher level of abstraction, the application layer, and we call that, that, that interface, that web interface calls the, the underlying smart contract. Okay, so all the applications that we see in, um, uh, in DeFi, they belong to this layer, if I, if I am to go back to the uh, to the map of the course uh, you may we are here now okay discussing the, the stack now weeks three and four Clitos is going to introduce the settlement uh, and um, uh, and asset layers either on ethereum or on other blockchains and we are going to be discussing in weeks five to nine the core functionality of DeFi, uh, so different types of DeFi applications uh, like derivatives, insurance, exchange, and so on. And these are the protocol layer where the smart contracts live and the application layer where, the, um, uh, the, where we can access these smart contracts from. I hope this is clear. So going back to the protocol layer, uh, the protocol layer is very much connected to the uh, application layer, which is, as, as we said, uh, where we actually access uh, DeFi apps uh, from. So this is an access layer. Most of us will be seeing things like this, and we think this is DeFi. This is just the access layer, the application layer uh, for, for, for DeFi, because we will not be interacting with the underlying protocol layer that actually contains the smart contracts, okay? Um, so you can think of the application layer as a front end that provides easy access to DeFi smart contracts for, for everyone. Um, and finally, we have the aggregation layer. This is another layer that tends to confuse people and I think with good reason. Uh, as as with here, where some assets are not easy to distinguish between, you know, whether they belong to the asset and the settlement layer. Uh, here, the boundaries are a bit more easy because this is smart contracts and this is Web2 interfaces. But however, you will see the lines here between um, uh, the aggregation and the application layer things might get a bit confusing again. And the reason is that the aggregation layer again consists of applications. Uh, the difference between the aggregation and the application layer is that the application layer apps uh, talk directly to smart contracts, whereas, uh, sorry, talk to individual smart contracts, whereas the aggregator level might call upon multiple applications and multiple uh, smart contracts at the same time or within the, the, the boundaries of a specific um, uh, uh, application. So the aggregation layer effectively is what combines many uh, DeFi apps in a single uh, access for users and therefore you might think of it not as an individual layer, but just as an extension of the uh, application layer. 
So, for example, you, you have aggregators like one inch. That's that's a, that's a, an easy example. Remember that I mentioned uh, decentralized uh, exchanges. So decentralized exchanges would allow you to uh, to exchange one uh, ERC twenty token, for example, for another uh, to exchange Uni for Sushi. Sometimes, especially when I have a large amount of tokens to uh, to exchange, I might find that it is not efficient for me to use the Uniswap. Um, smart contract which lives on the protocol and application layer to make the uh, the swapping because there's simply not enough liquidity there and my trade because it's a large trade would cause prices to fluctuate a lot so i might not use uniswap and go to sushi swap and uh, i might find the same thing there one inch comes to solve this problem by allowing you to Put your trade in a single interface. This is a, an exchange aggregator that effectively, as the name suggests, aggregates uh, many trades that happen in underlying exchanges. So if I want to exchange, I don't know, a million uni for, for sushi, it might split the order between Uniswap and SushiSwap and uh, Balancer and uh, you name it, other, other exchanges, and allow me to do a more efficient um, uh, execution of a transaction than I would be able to do by accessing the applications uh, individually. So as the, as the name suggests, the aggregation layer aggregates uh, functionality between individual protocols. But what I just described is just the tip of the iceberg because I described the functionality of one inch, for example, a specific protocol that aggregates exchanges. So all the uh, smart contracts that that is brought and that are brought under one inch belong to the same category of applications. What is interesting about DeFi is what we call composability. And composability is the ability to combine different uh, uh, applications across layers to create new types of of applications. Okay, so if we go back to the original picture. Uh, that, that show the different layers, these layers are not um, independent of each other. They can be called upon by each layer, can call upon the layers that, uh, below, uh, that belong beneath it. So we can have applications that are able to interact with each other in a permissionless manner, and this is what we call composability, the ability to build applications that talk to other applications, uh, in a way that users do not have to concern themselves with. It's hidden from the complexity is hidden from the from the end user, but we create uh, combinations of applications in, in the same way that we create uh, uh, more complex uh, Legos from, from individual building blocks. That's why sometimes you will hear the term money Lego to refer to this aspect of DeFi where more complex, more novel, more innovative applications are being built, not from scratch, but by combining elements of existing applications. Now, I've got a couple of examples, but please do not uh, go into, into, into detail because we still haven't um, um, covered the material that you need to, uh, to know what this means. But if, if I wanted to give you a an analogy in the Web2 world, I would uh, give you the, the, the example of uh, social media. So in, in Web2, if you have an account in uh, LinkedIn, in Twitter, and on Instagram, you have different um, digital objects uh, belonging to you or posted by you, like posts or uh, connections or followers or whatever that are not transferable between each application. Each application sits between, uh, behind a, a walled garden uh, that is dominated by one big tech uh, player, and they are individual applications. You cannot combine, uh, at least not in an easy and straightforward manner, your Twitter profile and your LinkedIn profile to create something of you know, higher value that combines uh, uh, both. I mean, you can... You can link the two accounts and have you know your your LinkedIn posts uh, 
um, uh, post it on, on Twitter automatically, but that's not a real, you know, uh, a combination of the two things. A composable type of uh, system would allow you to 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 enjoy the benefits of having all applications uh, working together. So, for example, we can we can build uh, such applications by uh, combining different Legos and the types, the number of combinations can be really astronomical here. So, uh, you know, out of uh, 1,500 DeFi projects, uh, the, 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 the number of their combinations by three exist, exceeds uh, or it's close to 4 billion. So it's really a very fertile ground for um, innovation to happen. And although it is not part of this introductory course, if you if you if you do, for example, the, uh, our master's degree, or if you, or if you do a more um, deep dive into DeFi, you will see uh, uh, such applications. So, for example, Compound, and not Compound that says here, Compound is a, a is is a protocol that uses uh, Legos from uh, the Dai stablecoin, the Maker DAO, uh, and the uh, its own smart contract to allow um, users to uh, take uh, collateralized loans in a, in, a, in a specific stable coin, get rewards in, in the form of tokens that are native to the compound ecosystem and uh, exchange in and out of, of, uh, of these tokens outside that ecosystem. Uh, Zerion is, a, is another example that uh, combines Uniswap, a decentralized exchange, MakerDAO, Compound that we saw earlier, and a number of wallets to be able to provide uh, users with a, uh, a unified service where uh, they can uh, do both borrowing and lending, uh, swapping, uh, yield farming and uh, liquidity provision, and so on. Um, again, these are terms specific to DeFi. If you are new to it, don't, don't worry. We'll, uh, we'll make everything clear in the coming weeks. What I want you to remember at this point is that DeFi applications should be built. They are not always, but should be built in a way that is uh, open for other applications to access them. This is, this is part of the philosophy of Web3 and decentralized applications. And this is what makes one of the properties that makes DeFi so interesting and promising. So concluding, uh, we saw today that DeFi can be abstracted into a stack of different layers. At the bottom layer, the foundational layer, we have settlement. Effectively, this is uh, the underlying layer one blockchain on which transactions become final and where security is being provided. Assets where the tokens live, either native, the assets of the blockchain, or non-native, the DeFi tokens, which can be governance, liquidity provision, or something else. The protocol layer, the core layer of DeFi, where the dApps live as in the form of smart contracts. The application layer, which is what most users see as the standard web interface uh, through which these smart contracts are being accessed. And the aggregation layer, where more complex higher level applications are being built that uh, make use of more than one uh, protocols. As always, you will find some optional further reading in the deck, some articles that might uh, uh, allow you to dig deeper in the, in the things like composability or the types of tokens in Ethereum or money, Legos or the stuff that we discussed uh, today. Um, uh, but these are not required in any ways for those of you that want to, to dig a deep, deeper from what we have been discussing today. Now, uh, with this, I would like to turn to your questions. Again, thank you very much uh, for, for posting these questions on Moodle. Let me take them one by one and also thank uh, Lambis and Manos who were again kind enough to put them together in a document for me earlier today. Uh, so uh, I've got a question from Benedict, I guess. What is the relationship between market cap and uh, TVL? We discussed TVL last week. It's total value locked. Um, technically, there's no relationship. 
Uh, market cap is, or market capitalization is the total value of the outstanding or maximum number of units in a particular protocol. So, for example, let's say if Uniswap, one unit out there, each token uh, uh, was valued at $10, its total market cap would be $10 million. Okay. It's the value of the protocol according to the market. Number of tokens multiplied by token. Uh, price in, in USD. Total value locked is the amount of money locked into whatever Uniswap is doing. Uh, liquidity pools, uh, lending protocols, you name it. Uh, so it could be that, you know, a, a very successful uh, uh, project in terms of market cap has a low PVL or the other way around. But mostly this is not the case. You would see that the most successful projects in terms of total value locked would have the higher market caps and newer projects, uh, startups, let's say in the DeFi space that are by, defin by definition have a lower market cap when they first their tokens first um, come out in the market would tend to have a lower uh, total value locked. So in that sense, there is a relationship, but it's not a technical or mathematical relationship. Uh, it's 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 rather how the market uh, defines them. Uh, Benedict goes on saying, "Could you say that market cap and TVL uh, equals the value of all existing coins?" No, uh, the value of all existing coins uh, is is the market cap. TVL is is not related to that. Okay, uh, Stanislav. Uh, Yes, uh, this is the question that I was remembering. Bitcoin blockchain is not mentioned among the end ones. Does it mean that DeFi apps do not uh, cannot be based on the Bitcoin chain? Yes, on the Bitcoin chain itself, no, because Bitcoin is not a, a, a Turing complete, uh, uh, does not have a Turing complete programming language. Uh, therefore, uh, it cannot um, support the creation of all sorts of smart contracts which are required to provide algorithmic governance in the case of, uh, of DeFi. Does the chain have to support contract execution or other computation model for DeFi? Exactly. It needs to support uh, smart contracts. Uh, Lauren is asking, what are some of the best use cases you've seen so far of combing? I think you mean combining apps, a composability, yes. Uh, I, again, uh, I will find, hide behind our disclaimer. I cannot uh, tell you what I think the best use cases are in, from a market perspective. I have my personal opinion, but it's, it's not to be, uh, let's say, shared in an educational uh, setting. Uh, what I believe is that the, the best use cases are going to be the ones that provide real value to users by hiding away abstraction uh, for things that users need. Some of the uh, composable applications that we see out there are quite complex, uh, so they might not be for the um, for the average user. And some of them are so complex that maybe no one, not even their developers, understand the uh, the intricacies and implications of taking them to extremes. So again, I will refer to what we saw um, in the past few weeks with uh, the Terra uh, Luna ecosystem. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, uh, we are at the forefront of innovation here and sometimes things that look too good to be true or are very complex to be uh, understood uh, might hide some risks or complexities that are uh, uh, difficult for us to grasp and we only see it in the aftermath. Alex is asking, the deck talks about aggregators like Zapper and Money Legos. Are these really DeFi aggregators or just Web2 apps that interact with several protocols? One and the same thing, you're correct. Uh, many of the aggregators are not smart contracts themselves. They are just web two apps that interact with smart contracts. Others might be uh, smart contracts. So both of them uh, I, I, would, I would place in the aggregator uh, category for the average user. For, for those of us that are a bit more, you know, uh, deeper into this space, you're right. There is a difference between an aggregator that's providing only access to smart contracts and an aggregator that is deploying a smart contract, but is actually doing something 
with uh, by calling other smart contracts. Um, CF Burger is saying, I'm a bit confused as to how the same token can exist on different blockchains. How does this work for wrapped tokens and especially for stable coins, since all these blockchains have vastly different settled times and vastly different gas prices? Uh, the question that uh, you're asking is about uh, effectively bridges that are going to be covered uh, in week four by, by Clitos. So how do we uh, transfer tokens between different blockchains and stable coins that's going to be covered in week five by Lambis? Let me say at this point uh, that um, the question was, how would the same token uh, exist on different blockchains? The reality is that it cannot. By definition, you cannot have the same token in different layer one blockchains because they are different blockchains and you cannot directly send from one to the other. Effectively, what, what happens when you're bridging, let's say, uh, USDT from uh, Ethereum to Avalanche is that you send your Ether to, uh, to a specific uh, address in the Ethereum blockchain where these ether become locked. They cannot be used anymore. And the bridge functionality effectively means, creates some new units, an equivalent amount of units of tether in the avalanche blockchain. So it is not that your ether has moved from, from Ethereum to blockchain to, to avalanche. Your ether is still on Ethereum, but it's locked and you now got the same amount of um, uh, Tether on Avalanche. The total amount of Tether in circulation remains the same because the locked ones do not count, they cannot move. They can only be unlocked when you decide to bridge back from Avalanche to Ethereum, in which case the new Tether that you had created will be burned, they will cease existing, and the ones that you had on Ethereum uh, are, 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 are created, okay? so. Um, that's, that's how, again, I'm being a bit simplistic. There are a number of technicalities and, and complexities and different uh, implementations, but you can think of the uh, bridging mechanism as a mechanism in, that locks tokens in one blockchain and magically creates uh, new units of these tokens in another blockchain. Um, Patrick is asking how the term semi-fungible defined. I think we've, we've covered that. Uh, again, Patrick, two-part question. Understand how governance tokens and the collective ownership and decision-making model, practically speaking, was the Terra, UST, and Luna debacle an example of how these structures do not represent the best informed position of token holders? As I've said earlier, it is an example of what can go wrong when we either do not understand every implication of a potential uh, you know governance or tokenomics uh, type of implementation model uh, or whether we all become collectively blind uh, to warning signs as, as you say uh, that we tend to dismiss uh, mara is asking about polkadot polkadot claims to be a layer zero as it only provides security to your parachains what is the difference between layer zero and layer one very good question. Uh, again, I don't want to go into technical details. It's not part of this course. Maybe some of this is going to be answered by Clitos next week. But let me say that indeed, Polkadot is following a different um, um, uh, setup paradigm. The idea of Polkadot is that there is a, a uh, let's say an underlying blockchain that's called a relay chain that only provides uh, security to application specific blockchains that are built on top of it or communicate with it that are called parachains. So each parachain is not a token, is a blockchain in its own right that is borrowing the security uh, infrastructure of the underlying Polkadot blockchain. In that sense, you can say that, yes, technically, uh, I don't know if I would use the term layer zero or layer one. These are mostly marketing terms, to be honest. Uh, there is a different layer where Polkadot lives, 
and the and the different layer on top of that where the parachains live, but all of them are belong to the settlement layer uh, of the scheme that I showed you earlier. So, yeah, you might hear people using the term uh, layer zero. Some bridges are using it as a term. Layer one, layer two. Now I've heard layer three. Uh, these are mostly, you know. Um, um, marketing positioning of, of different protocols. Uh, the, the idea is that the, the first layer, the foundational layer, the settlement layer is where security and transaction finality is, is being um, uh, provided. So in the case of Polkadot, uh, both the Polkadot and its uh, parachain where, where uh, the transactions are happening are collectively belonging to the settlement layer. Isaac, I, th I think it's the same uh, question. Uh, Aristides has three bullets. So does the asset layer, uh, e.g. Ethereum, by the way, Ethereum is not the asset layer. Ethereum is the blockchain, is the settlement layer. Ether is the asset. Um, so does the asset layer hold all assets and their attributes? Yes, for example, the NFT world will hold its NFT and its properties. Yes, but uh, I'm not sure what you mean by holding because these are abstraction layers. Uh, the asset layer does not exist as, a, as another blockchain. Uh, it, it is an abstraction layer on top of the blockchain. So all the NFTs in the case of Ethereum, as well as all, all the Ether and all the maker tokens and all the USDT on Ethereum, they belong and they're held in uh, uh, addresses that are on the Ethereum blockchain, the, the underlying uh, settlement layer. Second bullet, what are non-native tokens? I think we covered this. Uh, ERC721, governance, liquidity provider, they are all non-native tokens, you are correct. Native is the token that exists on the blockchain if no application was ever built on top of it. So. We cannot think of Ethereum without Ether. It's the gas token, right? So it's, an, it's a native, native token. Uh, Tether might stop existing one day. Uh, nothing will be affected in, in Ethereum, right? So this is a non-native token. Same for CryptoPunks or Apes. Uh, how do LB tokens work? I think I've covered this in the presentation. If, if you have any more questions, please uh, ask them in the, in the chat and I will go there in the Q&A. Uh, Brian, is the asset layer truly distinct from the settlement layer? As you suggest, it's a convenient way of thinking about it. As I've said, they are not really distinct. Uh, the, the whole, the whole discussion of today is a convenient way of thinking, conceptualizing about uh, DeFi. Um, Paul is asking, it seems to me that its applications in the application layer would typically be built around a single protocol, whereas the application layer uses multiple protocols, correct, or it might use the aggregation layer multiple applications. Would it be true that aggregation is more likely to direct directly with the smart contracts and bypass the application layer, as we discussed earlier, it's possible, but it's not you know, more or less likely. The aggregation layer might uh, uh, access protocols through the application, through the application layer, sorry, or by bypassing the application layer altogether. Uh, these are all your questions in the Moodle. Let me go back to the q and I don't know if you can see this. If you cannot, just click on Q&A and you see that there are seven open uh, questions and there are 32 answered. So thank you very much, Lambi and, and uh, uh, Mano for uh, answering these. Uh, I think we will be making all the written answers available on, on Moodle for our students to, to have a look after the, the live session and obviously the recording of the live session itself. So, uh, Siam Kant is asking, the term DeFi is used by some people to be synonymous with open finance. Are they justified in the use of these two terms interchangeably? Thanks for your patience. Well, yes and no. DeFi is decentralized finance, which 
should be open, but there are DeFi applications that are not open. So there are protocols nowadays coming up that uh, uh, require KYC uh, for, for people that are um, using them. Open finance is about openness and permissionlessness, which uh, uh, can be built on uh, decentralized or centralized applications. So the terms are very highly overlapping, but not 100% the same thing. Um, T is asking, does that mean, which that, the native tokens, oops, sorry, uh, here, if doesn't have to comply with their own standard for other apply, uh, fungible tokens on the chain. Yes, correct. Ether is not an ERC-20 token. Ether is a native token and has a different functionality. So ERC is about creating non-native tokens only. Um, Justin is asking, uh, are you referring to aggregation and application layers? If so, they are currently accessible via web. Do you think the average person will access these apps via Web3 as a matter of course? Uh, that's a very good question. And has to do with whether, if I understand the question correctly, whether uh, I think that uh, in the future, the application and aggregation layers are going to be Web3. Uh, I think they should. I mean, if we are talking about a real move to Web3, uh, most if not all of our access to smart contracts should happen for the non-developers among us through Web3 architectures. We're not there yet because Web3 is mostly, you know, vaporware at this, at this point in time. We're mostly discussing it rather than really having it, at least in, in any real uh, sense, but, but we're, we're going there. In the future, this is going to, to happen. Um, a question from an anonymous attendee, Cas can Cosmos be considered an aggregator hub of blockchains? Cosmos is an ecosystem uh, that is, as you say, horizontally designed. Uh, I would uh, not place it within a, a DeFi layer scheme. It's not a DeFi uh, thing, okay? It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a blockchain ecosystem. Fabrizio is asking, are bridges a sensible point of value? For example, Ronin Wallet's hack was due to this situation. Correct. Bridges are, I personally consider bridges very, very promising. Uh, we cannot, I cannot think that we can, we will live in the future in a world in which we have different uh, layer one blockchains that are not talking to each other. Interoperability is a huge thing. In the early days of the internet, I mean, would you imagine how the world would be if we had different internets? We had the Ethereum internet and the Avalanche internet and you know the internets and the webs did not talk to each other. This cannot happen. Uh, so either other blockchains will die, uh, a natural death and only one or two will remain because they will um, uh, attract more and more users or which is uh, more the case, we, we need to build some bridging uh, layer for, for assets to be transferable between blockchains in a way that is seamless and transparent to users. The current bridges do not achieve this objective yet. So yes, they are a probable point of failure. Uh, and every time I'm personally bridged assets between blockchains, uh, I've always, you know, been biting my nails to to make sure that the transaction uh, goes through and nothing uh, is failed because there is this intermediate point of time in which your assets are locked in, in in the originating blockchain and they have not yet been minted and released in the other blockchain and anything can happen in between but i think this is a function of their novelty okay it's it's a very new phenomenon so we need to, uh, to 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 give it some time to develop and be more mature but i'm sure that one of the um, uh, again this is not investment advice but if if i were to look at promising applications for the next wave of development in crypto i would look at at, at bridges as as a as a as a subsector of crypto where some interesting things will be happening in the next few years. Uh, T is following up on bridges. A bridge consists uh, then of two smart contracts, protocol layer of each involved blockchain, settlement layer, as well as a DAP interacting with them. Oh, 
that's kind of complicated. Okay, we have two settlement layers for sure, because we're talking about two different blockchains. Uh, since we are talking about two different blockchains and things that need to happen in both of them, we're definitely talking about two smart contracts, right? And since some uh, application would need to uh, govern what is happening between these two smart contracts, this is an application that lives away uh, from from both blockchains and this is what uh, the previous student called and i agree with him or her a, a a a probable single point of failure so yes two different blockchains two different contracts and one app uh, that might not be a dap uh, a decentralized application um, governing the whole process Nicholas is saying since Ethereum stores the NFTs on their smart contracts on the asset layer differently from other chains that stores them on the wallet itself, would it change the layer that the user is holding it? Uh, okay, now we're talking about where assets really live. And Nicholas is, is mentioning two things, assets living on the blockchain and assets, assets living in your wallet. Technically, assets always live on the blockchain. There, there cannot be an asset that is not existing on the blockchain. If it's not existing on the blockchain, it doesn't exist, period. So your wallet effectively holds the private keys that allow you to access that asset. Uh, you know, send it, uh, burn it, uh, exchange it, do whatever you want with it, it's yours. To prove ownership, you have to have a private key and, and the private key is what lives in your wallet. Actually, your wallet is a collection of private keys, period. The assets themselves live on the blockchain. So uh, again, our other MOOC does a brilliant job, I think, Andreas Antonopoulos in explaining um, what lives where, but Although we tend to think that we have our wallet and, you know, because I, we see our NFT or our token balance in our wallet, in our MetaMask, for example, it actually is inside MetaMask. It's not. It, 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 it is always in a blockchain, right? That's why we say not your keys, not your coins. If you see your balance in, in your wallet, it means that you have your private keys and this is your um, uh asset as long as your private keys are not compromised. If you see your balance in Kraken or Coinbase or Binance or any centralized wallet, effectively, you don't have anything. You have a, an entry in Binance's database saying that George has one Ether. But this one Ether is with Binance, right? They have the private key to that Ether that is living somewhere in the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, to the extent that I have not withdrawn that Ether, to a, to a self custody wallet, I don't have it. Pedro is asking in which layer a DAO will be placed. They are smart contracts, but they also hold assets. Of course, since they are smart contracts, they are the protocol uh, layer. All smart contracts will hold assets, so that's no difference there. We'll discuss DAOs in week uh, nine, from what I see. Uh, Matthew is asking if I connect my trust wallet to OpenSea, which area of the stack am I operating in? I'm searching for a practical example to understand. Okay, when you connect your trust wallet to OpenSea, effectively you are looking at the assets that are held in uh, in um, uh, in the in the in the accounts, the private keys of which uh, exist in your wallet, right? So. They are definitely not on OpenSea. OpenSea is an application layer access uh, uh, layer thing, but your assets always are in the asset layer, right? Uh, your wallet is an application that accesses these assets. And Aris is asking about the other MOOC. Correct, the other MOOC uh, will start again in uh, September. Sorry, it just uh, finished, uh, so you missed it. But I think, uh, no, I think you cannot register for it. Now you have to register for the introductory MOOC that starts again in uh, September. Okay, I think we've covered everything. As with last week, thank you very much. I'm super happy to see so many of you here and so much discussion and so many questions, both on Moodle and here today. Uh, I will leave you with uh, this. 
Uh, next week, uh, Kletos uh, will take over for to discuss Ethereum in more detail. Uh, again, let me uh, remind everyone that normally the live sessions take place on um, uh, Wednesdays. So last week's Tuesday was an exception. I think we have another exception, but please monitor Moodle to see uh, every week's uh, exact day and time. We will do our best, as uh, it was suggested by many of you, to post the slides uh, before the weekend so that you have time over the weekend to, to read it. Sorry uh, when this has not been possible and we had to, to post them uh, just a couple of days before the live session. Thank you very much and uh, see you. Uh, well, I will see you in uh, four weeks' time, uh, but uh, you will see Kletos and uh, Lambis for the next three weeks. Uh, take care. Bye-bye, everyone.